the mistletoe margarita, the Scrooge driver, the North Pole punch. The holidays call for cocktails, so get everything you'll need for them delivered with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. So what's it gonna be? Classics like Bullet Bourbon, Don Julio Reposado, or Kettle One, or maybe something new. Find it all on Drizzly where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered for any holiday festivity. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. At Sleep Outfitters Outlet, great sleep is a big deal. Save 40 to 60% every day on every Sealy, Stearns & Foster, and Tempur-Pedic. Queens as low as two forty nine. dollars Customer exchanges, closeouts, and floor samples. Inventory changes daily, so come in for your dream deal today. With no credit needed financing, expert advice, and up to 60% off retail, it's never been easier to get the sleep and savings you deserve. Go to sleepoutfittersoutlet.com for financing details and to find a store near you. Welcome to this podcast. This is episode 47. My name is Tim Mitchell, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kulide in Mr. Mississauga, Ontario. Oh, by the way, I'm in Toronto, but yeah, let me do that again. Right. <laughs> Ah, uh, what the hell? I'm in Toronto. Jonathan, you're Mississauga? Uh, here I am in Mississauga. Let's right. go Raptors! Let's go Raptors. Kawhi, Kawhi. Oh, we're going to get Kawhi tattooed up. All the kids are going to be called Kawhi from now on. Well, it's probably better than Daenerys, so... True, true. Well, I mean, even the 15-year-old, he'll be called Kawhi. He won't oh. he'll understand, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Number one fan of the show, Kawhi. Cool line. That works. Yes, yes. Uh, if we could just find a K middle name, we'll be all set. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's not do that. All right. Now that we're all laughing our heads off, do we have any fact check? Well, we can sort of do the we can share the fact check, I guess, right? Well, uh, yeah. If you want to, you want to start us off. Sure. I think last week I was talking about the show, which is an awesome show called Life on Mars. Um, and I was talking about I think uh, what was the name of the guy? I oh, forget the name of the actor. But anyway, um, that was a show about a guy, uh, John Sim. He plays uh, DI, DCI to Sam Taylor, who finds himself you know in 1973 after some sort of accident, and uh, so the the second show that I couldn't remember the name of is Ashes to Ashes, which, of course, takes place in the 80s. Get it? No, maybe unless you have to be a really big uh, Bowie fan to get that one, I guess. I don't think you need to be a big Bowie fan. I think well, even, a, even a casual someone. Bowie fan might get that one. Right, okay. So, yeah, and of course, you know, uh, Bowie actually makes a, a cameo appearance in, in one of the early episodes of Ashes to Ashes. He plays a clown, <laughs> which I didn't know, so I'll have to go back and watch it again, I guess. Um, but anyway, so there was an American sequel as well. Um, oh, so oh, I've got 458. Is that me? Did you add that or did I? Oh, so no, yeah, I added that. That's, uh, you, I think that my, um, that was my okay. note because I didn't see that you would put that in until I pasted mine in. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So I, I started talking about it at 4 30 actually in the show, but last week. But I also have a link here and I'll put it in show notes to Life on Mars, the, the tr- UK trailer, the original one. The Americans did, of course, a copy of Life on Mars and, uh, it was not bad. And then, uh, of course, I've got a link here to the Ashes to Ashes one. And Ashes to Ashes one is about a lady named DCI Alex Drake who gets shot. She remembers seeing the bullet and the next thing she knows, she's in 1981. And of course, being a female cop in 1981 was quite different than being a female cop in the 2000s, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. As you can imagine. So a lot of, you know, and it's funny, I think one of the char- one, I think um, John Sims' partner in the first series is her captain in the second series. I think, I think that's one of the connections. Yeah, it's quite, quite good. And Life on Mars, um, the, uh, the US one is interesting. But it's interesting because because um, typical of US or typical of UK shows, it only went for two, se- two series and then they wrap it up, right? Uh, yeah. Two, six shows or whatever. Yeah. Don't Same spoil like, a good thing. Yeah. So, but, but, and I'm going to spoil the American one because the American one spoils it by saying how they explain it is he wakes up on, and he's an astronaut on his way to Mars. That's weird. Yeah. And he's dream life on Mars, can it? And he's dreaming, like he's in suspended animation. He has this whole fantasy about being this cop in the 1970s. That's weird, eh? Very weird, yes. But, you know, so it's like a weird sort of sci-fi cop show. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. 
it, it's interesting because I mean, all the, all the while you're watching it, you're kind of thinking like, because they do actually try and explain themselves to some of their confidants, right? And and uh, they kind of look and go, whoa, that's kind of weird, you know. Anyway, at one point, one of the one of the, one, as he's as, uh, one of them is explaining to to one of the coworkers, you're kind of like Luke Skywalker, you know. <laughs> anyway, I must have been in the ashes to ashes one based on the time frame. Anywho, so do we have any more fact check? Yeah, a couple more things. So uh, we were talking about the highest grossing movies uh, in our last pod. And we were talking about the ones, you know, we were talking about how Avengers Endgame is creeping up there. And we mentioned adjusted for inflation. And I said, I think Gone with the Wind is still the highest grossing film of all time, adjusted for inflation, because it was such a huge phenomenon right. when it first yep. came out. So uh, our good uh, uh, friends here at IMDb have a list of the highest grossing blockbusters of all time, adjusted for inflation. Um, so we'll find that you can find that link in here. Gone with the Wind. So, so let me start with Avengers Endgame. So Avengers Endgame, as of this list uh, being up, is $2.48 billion, which is phenomenal. Uh, but if you adjust for inflation, that's st- still the sixth highest grossing movie of all time. Wow. Hmm. Uh, fifth is Sound of Music, uh, $2.5 billion. Uh, Star Wars, adjusted for inflation, about $2.9 to $3 billion, depending on how you calculate that. That's the first movie? That's the original 1977 Star Wars. Okay. Yeah. Right. Avatar is uh, $3.5 point two billion dollars titanic 3.2 to 3.4 depending on uh adjustments and gone with the wind 3.4 to 3.8 billion dollars in today's money wow i thought i heard the other day that i saw something james cameron tweeted that that the end game had taken had overtaken end game sorry it, it, over, overtaken so, so in actual dollars uh and avengers end game is number two now uh because it passed okay. titanic which in actual dollars uh, uh the highest grossing film in actual dollars is still Avatar, followed now by Avengers Endgame, followed by Titanic. So he was congratulating them on passing Titanic, um, which is very magnanimous of him, considering he still has the top spot, as opposed to the top two spots. Um, But, yeah, if you adjust the inf- for inflation, it's it's still not even close. Like, I mean, it's still a billion and a half dollars off for an agent flush, uh, adjusted for inflation dollars. Right. Um, okay. So yeah, it just gives you a sense of you know blockbusters have been a thing for a long time. Where we're you know we're very much in the world where we're like, oh my gosh, look at all the money that's being made. But again, the uh, you know phenomenons like these movies have been a thing for a long time. Uh, you know, Gone with the Wind is 1939. Um, you know, at at the time it made 400 million dollars uh, at the box office. But again. And adjust for inflation. You know, they were selling tickets for, you know, 10 cents a ticket. Like it's, it's, it's really? staggering, wow. you know? Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So the fact that it may, has made that much money is, is again, it's a breathtaking amount of money for the time and even now. True. True. And Kirby, Kirby has something to say about it, obviously. Yes. I think that squirrel get off my lawn. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I had in here uh, is at 3305, we were talking about fan made Star Trek series. And I couldn't remember which one we were speaking about because there have been oh. many over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I found this link and it's just a wikipedia page so take it for what it's worth but the wikipedia page lists all the star trek fan productions uh some films some series you know web series and stuff like that um it's amazing there's so many like i i I, i'm amazed by how many there are um you know i think the ones we were talking about were probably um oh there's star trek phase two we talked about star trek continues was the one star trek continues was in here yeah so and uh, yeah and the one that our listener fan friend of my sister's uh, I think it was Star Trek NXR XNR oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but yeah it's it's uh, it's pretty impressive when you look down this list of you know the the, the number of the, that there are and all the work that's gone into them and uh, yeah so it's kind of a neat little little trip I must admit I'm not huge on the Star Wars fan product or Star Trek fan, fan productions I should say but uh, yeah it's, it's really kind of cool to go down this list and realize and then the, you, you look through this the first one was 1974 so people were doing this you know way back in the time you know they were shooting a on uh, uh, an hour long film on uh, 16 millimeter film so so, oh. so this just in basically i am wearing an apple watch right now so of course i've got apple news on it us president donald trump has just fully pardoned canadian newspaper publisher conrad black <laughs> well how nice for him how convenient yes boy anyway anyway all right let's move on let's all move right. on to the real headlines headlines okay so uh, hot off the uh, the discussion we finished off our last podcast with uh, we got news this weekend the Orville has officially been renewed for season three. Um, I guess it's not that big a surprise, although we uh, we did outline in our last uh, pod some of the potential reasons why it may not have come back. Um, there's still no word about a a contract extension for Seth MacFarlane. Uh, oh, really? 
really? Yep. No, that, that wasn't part of the uh, part Maybe of the release. Fall in a tar pit or something. But uh, but I guess one way or the other, the show is coming back. So uh, good news for fans of the Orville. Again, right. I th- I think it finished strong, and uh, you know I think you and I both agree that uh, it's probably not our favorite piece of sci-fi right now. But I think it's it's certainly watchable, and there, there's mm-hmm. certainly a lot of room for growth. So hopefully it will uh, continue to to improve. Right now, I, I just have to point out that at the moment when I was tweeting last week about your three points about your three facts about you know the Orville that people hadn't been thinking about like the one that hadn't been renewed and all that kind of stuff right was at that moment was when this story broke <laughs> yes I have been evil and karma gods have punished me for mocking the Orville yeah there you go all right so uh, here's another one actually I think I may have made it my pick yes I did make it my pick um, so this is a story this it was came out I saw this on um, I forget which site oh I guess it would be IndieWire.com um, the headline is what if Netflix released a 70 million dollar blockbuster and no one noticed. Oh, wait, they just did, right? Um, and they're talking about the movie called Wandering Earth, which is this amazing, and it might be a pick later, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, um, amazing Chinese science fiction movie that apparently was was like all the rage in in China. Like, And watching it, it's like the production value is like second to none. It's like, you know, Avengers Endgame quality good. And it's a space sci-fi, you know, like it's it's like it's like uh, anything. Well, not quite as far as Ridley Scott, but it's got that sort of grand scape scale to it, you know, um, yep. that kind of good quality stuff. Like it's it's a really it's an amazing movie. It you know, you know of course it's shown in in with English uh, overdubbing, right? And the the overdubbing and the subtitles don't match up, which is comical. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's definitely worth a watch. I, it's it's you know because of the, I think I think it's one of these things where you can't, I think it would be better seen if you understood Chinese and could listen to it in the original language because it probably probably loses a lot in the tra- in not in the translation but in the you know what I mean like the yeah, yeah. the syncing I guess you know you don't really notice that they're not talking English because it's a, it's a grand scale movie I definitely recommend it people have a look at it yeah I saw the trailer for it the other day and thought this is unusual I should, I should maybe watch it we did, talk, we did talk about it um, like it wasn't like we didn't notice we did notice because we talked about it sometime in the middle of our first season so mm-hmm. it might have been my pick i can't remember from mine or jaime's or whatever yep. yeah Ooh. yeah there you go actually i guess we'll look it up well you introduce the next thing all right um so we got news as well from uh netflix speak netflix um they are going to be teaming up to uh, produce more dark horse comics based series so umbrella academy obviously something we've all watched um was a was a hit for them and uh, enough that they are uh, going to do more of that so they've signed a deal that they can uh, access a little bit more from that catalog so no word yet on what they're going to delve into to, but um, you know, famous series from that uh, from that comic publisher. Um, you know, they could do the Mask, which is a famous film. Obviously, mm-hmm. Jim Carrey uh, is a Dark Horse property. Sin City, the uh, the uh, Frank Miller series. Uh, they have Emily the Strange, very popular, uh, you know, sort of quirky series. Um, they have Concrete. They, you know, there's so many really really strong um, Dark Horse public uh, publications they could choose from. Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of doom and gloom about. You know, the fact that they've sort of cut their ties with Marvel and what are they going to do? Obviously, they're still working on, uh, they had acquired Miller World, which is um, uh, based on the comic uh, properties of Mark Miller, the uh, Scottish uh, writer who's very prolific and created the, the series like uh, the film Wanted is based on his work and uh, he's done a whole bunch of stuff. So it seems like they're still not out of the superhero comic book genre game, uh, mm-hmm. but maybe they're going a different direction. Pretty cool. Right, right, cool. Uh, do you want to sub in for, for Jaime? Jaime's left us some notes in Absentia. He's a uh, Away on business this week. What so does the, he say? Um, <clears> well, he says, <throat> so those, two are, those two are interrelated. That's why I stuck that one up there. Have you read them? I haven't even looked at them. Oh, okay. Well, so yeah, I can. Uh, so the first one is that um, we got news that the Pard series that is going to be coming to uh, CBS All Access is going to stream internationally on Amazon Prime Video and not Netflix, which is interesting because uh, obviously there is a partnership there established with Star Trek Discovery internationally airing on Netflix. Uh, and we we also, uh, that sort of left us with a day of speculation. Okay, well, they announced it for international, but not for North America. Um, right. What is that going to mean for us? And the following day, they announced that it's actually going to air on Space Channel and Crave here in Canada. So just like uh, Discovery, you'll be able to get that on Space and Crave. So good for us, but a little confusing for international, because now you're looking at having to have two platforms if you want to continue to watch uh, stuff from the same universe, which is a little weird. Right. We didn't talk about the Apple TV app, did we, 
last week? No. It just I think it just dropped this week. Um, I have it installed on my iPad so I can have a look at it. Because one of the big stories about that is that, that Netflix seems to be the only, one of the companies that's left in the cold because they don't want to, they want to, don't want to align with Apple. But, you know, like you can get HBO, you can get Crave, all that kind of stuff on the Apple app. So, and you, so in other words, you would do your subscription through the App Store. Hmm. Yeah. So like you could, you know, go to Rogers and you, and you just like the TM Go, TMN Go app or HBO Go, what do we, what do we call? Oh, Crave, I guess. It's Crave it now. Yeah. Crave, Crave yeah. has absorbed those. Just like that. You can set up an account with Crave and watch it. You know, you just log in that way. Mm-hmm. Like I watched, I watched a bit of a show that I missed on um, my PVR because I, I didn't get back to the PVR in time. It races every two weeks. But um, so I was able to watch the show, but I just had to log into my Rogers account. So I, I would assume if you have Bell content and it seems to be smart enough to know what, you know, what content you have from each a different provider. So I think you're able to create multiple associations that way, which is kind of weird and cool at the mm. same time. But it kind of leaves Netflix, you know, hanging a bit. Yeah, like that's, uh, yeah, well, we're going to keep going into, uh, we've got a few different ones in a row here that are going to tie into the uh, streaming sure. services and where these things are going too, because mm-hmm. it's been a complicated week and it's going to keep getting more complicated as time passed here. Right, right. So uh, Jaime had a story for us here that uh, AT&T is going to pull its licensed series from Netflix and Hulu. Um, and, you know, I think we'd had a hint that that was coming. We had a story previously about Netflix being in trouble for, for losing it, but it, now it's not just them. It's um, it's all streaming services are going to lose this stuff because um, AT&T uh, is going to pull its Warner Media stuff, which means, again, Friends, Office, um, some of the most popular streaming series that are available on uh, some of the other platforms are, are out the window. Um, Where are they going to go? Well, they're going to start their own app, of course, Tim. Oh, Come on. Seriously. That's how it goes. So uh, NBC Universal is going to be starting its own app next year. Uh, I'm telling so, you guys, are miss, going to miss cable in a few years. I, I know it's it's going to seem like the halcyon days. Or you know, hey, here's a nutty thought: you can buy still buy TV on DVD for like That's pennies true. on the dollar. That's you know, true. if I want to watch, uh, you know, I don't know what Star Trek. I have all the Star Treks on DVD still. I can just pop those in my player and I don't have to worry about having a streaming service. Um, but yeah, it's 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 we're starting to see more and more. You know, everybody was licensing their things out to these third parties for the longest time. Now everybody's like, hey why are we doing this? We're not going to make nearly what we'd make if we get people to sign up and, you know, charge them by the month. So, yeah, more and more people are realizing that the content is key. Again, that's what made Disney's acquisition of Fox so shrewd is that, you know, sure, it cost them, you know, $60 billion, but to be able to pull together their catalog plus the catalog of all that, uh, plus this, the new stuff that they're developing, uh, you know, it's going to give them a pretty powerful uh, leverage for people who are like, I don't know which one of these things to choose. And it's also going to continue as we see these things eroding around them you know think about what's on netflix now and think okay so if that was boiled down to mostly just their originals and a few small partnership that changes the landscape a lot um and especially considering netflix has been leveraging pretty hard over the last couple of years uh spending a lot of money on production um if they start to see declines in in revenue from streaming that's gonna hurt right mm-hmm. how much do we start getting ads in our uh netflix queues to try and help make up the shortfalls <laughs> yeah. yeah all right um yeah so i I, I was going to say that it was interesting. I went to um, a talk yesterday at our local iOS meetup, and a friend of mine, Mark Pavlidis, did a talk on subscriptions, which was kind of interesting from uh, as an app developer, kind of interesting to me. But a couple of facts he, he put out was uh, that uh, uh, 80%, I think 80% of apps on the App Store right now are subscription-based, right? Mm. So, and, and the terminology he used, he, at one point in the, in the talk, he said, we're living, we're in a rental economy right now, which, you know, kind of makes sense in that sense that like, you know, Jaime's, we're all talking about like the speculating about these, like, you know, Jaime signs up for CBS All Access during, uh, you know, Star Trek de- um, Discovery and then he, then he cancels the subscription and then he'll renew it again next year until CBS All Access comes with, with enough shows that he would just continue to perpetuate his his, his contract, right? Yep. So that's, I think that, that may be the way people, people kind of consume this stuff. I mean, people will sign up for HBO until Game of Thrones is done and then they'll, then they'll, they'll quit, right? Right? So yeah, um, that's kind of a, that's kind of sort of where we're going. But it's interesting that you know because the reason why Mark gave the talk was that he built an app that you know w- it was pretty successful. Um, they won Apple Apple Design Awards for it and all that kind of stuff. But they started looking at subscriptions a couple of years ago, and then as Apple has sort of uh, lightened the restrictions on what you can do with subscriptions, he's they've they've sort of gotten more and more into it. So he was sharing some of the knowledge that he's gained over the last couple of years, and it's kind of a slow trick 
trickle, you know, like it, it, it slowly it just climbs up and up and up and up in terms of in terms of uh, people subscribing to your product, right? So I think, I mean, obviously everybody's getting it. You know, you kind of think that people are getting it. I would think that people are getting into subscriptions like the AT&Ts and Disney's and, you know, because they see what Netflix is doing, they see what Hulu's doing, they see what the, they see the writing on the wall, you know, they missed the boat on, on the whole um, Napster thing, right? Um, and Apple's clearly making a huge profit and successful on subscriptions as well. Like it's, I think, up to almost 30% of their business now. Yeah. Which is a lot, 15% anyway. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see where that's going. And, and I think that's the reality is we're no longer going to have, be satisfied with just a, you know, a Rogers or a Bell TV subscription. We're going to have to have all these other things if we want to consume these shows, right? Yeah, no, it's true. I think, uh, you know, it, it is, the landscape is changing and it's not just changing, you know, year by year. It's changing month by month. It's it's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of crazy. Yeah, so as we continue our, our uh, dis- dissection of the world of streaming services, so uh, Disney has now assumed full control of Hulu. Um, you know, we knew that they had obviously purchased the stake that Fox owned uh, in, in their acquisition of Fox's assets. Um, but they've also, uh, they have bought, Hulu bought back its share of uh, interest that was owned by AT&T, right, right. which was 9.5%. So Disney and Comcast together have agreed to buy that portion. And uh, so now it's basically, there's only two owners left. It's Disney owns portion, they own the, the majority share, and Comcast owns the other 33%. So it's 66 to 33. Right. Um, but Comcast and Disney entered into this agreement that allows Disney to uh, take full control of it. So they basically get to run it. Um, and Comcast and Disney both have the right in 2024 to exercise a purchase of the remaining 33% from Comcast to Disney. Really? So okay. it's basically, it's a short-term deal um, that allows Comcast to get its ducks in a row for doing its own thing. And then they're going to pull the plug on their interest in it. And then it'll be basically a Disney-only app. So you, you, you're not American and I'm not American, but I, I suspiciously noticed that there's a peacock on the top of Comcast's logo. There is. There so is. do they own NBC, NBC Universal? They do. Yes. Yeah, so that's they're going to do their own app oh, starting okay, next right. year, and they're going to basically simultaneously have their stuff on Hulu, and they're going to have their stuff on their own app. Oh, and I then see, right. within a couple of years, they'll be able to basically exercise the right to take that content back. Right. Right. So, wow. so does, what it does mean though is that that if you look at the slate that is now out there for Disney, they as we talked about, this is where we thought they were going. They're going to have uh, Disney. Disney Plus, which is going to be their PG platform. They're going to have Hulu, which is going to allow them to do the more mature stuff because we already established they're, they're starting to uh, program for that already. They're going to do Ghost Rider and some of the more mature Marvel comic stuff. I imagine, you know, some of those properties that they acquired from Fox, like Aliens, um, will end up there. Um, and then they've also got things like Freeform and some of the sort of, you know, lighter stuff as well. Mm. Um, tie that into owning ABC and ESPN and you basically, you, you can sell that as individual streaming services or collective streaming services. So, hey, you could pay $8 a month for each one of these, or if you bundle them, you can get them for 25 bucks a month. Mm, right. um, you know, and uh, so uh, as part of this, uh, the understanding is that Hulu is, uh, Disney has said that they plan to launch Hulu in Canada soon. So, Oh, really? Huh. Yes. Yeah. So this is, you know, it's easy to look at this and say, well, this is not our, our issue, oh, but oh, yeah. we know that uh, they're not going to launch day of the uh, same as uh, Disney Plus, they're not going to launch it immediately here in Canada or internationally, but we do know that uh, the plan is to take both those things international as well. So um, yeah, so again, more platforms, more services, but uh, it sounds like they're going to have the content to fill those things too, which is, you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be good, but it's going to be even more spread out. Right, right. Mm. So our next story, I read this as Conan shows canceled. No, no. Lauren Cohan. Aha. So uh, Lauren Cohan found out this week that Whiskey Cavalier, her her, uh, series at ABC has been cancelled after one season. Uh, famously, she was in a contract dispute with uh, AMC over continuing to stay on The Walking Dead and mm-hmm. decided that she would uh, take a hiatus. She didn't actually quit the show. She took a hiatus from the show to go work on Whiskey Cavalier mm-hmm. and she did uh, go do that and apparently it was uh, a one season, one and done. Wow. So, yeah. So she's gone um, and there's no con- confirmation yet whether or not she's 
going back to Walking Dead or she could do something else. But right. uh, that certainly opens the door for, for uh, Walking Dead fans, who I'm sure are pretty excited at the prospect of getting her back because she was one of the highlights. Yeah, yeah. And they, all they did was it throughout the whole series. They kept saying, Where's, where is she? Where'd Maggie go? I, have mm. you seen Maggie? Yeah, I think I saw her go that way a little while ago. Or, yeah, or, or, exactly. Or, 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 well, and again, they, did, they deliberately didn't write her out. And they knew they were sort of, you know, losing a little strength. Uh, obviously, Andrew Lincoln moving on as well. So right, yeah. it is a big deal for them to... Uh, to, you know, try to keep the door open anyways. I don't know if I told you, but I'm done with The Walking Dead. Yeah, I, I haven't watched anything this season. I, I might catch up with it if it ends up back on Netflix or some other service. I might, you know, binge it over the summer or something, but I just couldn't commit doing it on a week by week basis. Well, it's not so, not so much that. I think some of the some of the plot lines have gotten just wrong, weird, strange, Game of Thrones ish, or they're trying to be like Game of Thrones, and it just it's gotten you know it's like I, I remember I asked I asked our friend friend of the show George Tromalopoulos once about The Walking Dead. He just says I just I don't watch that show, and I go I go why not? And he goes well because it's he knows how it's going to end. It's all was going to be the same. Just going to keep walking through the countryside, killing zombies, you know, like. Yeah. And that was one of the strengths of the show. Like one of the reasons I loved the comic from the first time I read it, which was a very long time ago now. um, One of the reasons I loved it is because it it, it answers that question, what happens after, right? And it just continues into like, not just how do you survive that initial outbreak or whatever, but how do you continue to live in that world? What do you do? What what, what choices will you make? I thought that was really, really smart. Uh, And this series has done a good job capturing that too. The question is, you know, how long can you sustain? that um right yeah you know yeah. At, at a point it, it's you know the stars are getting you know well i want to go do something else and so that's you know how long can you keep the momentum of that up without it becoming stale and i think we might be getting our answer yeah i mean and like you know, introducing characters like negan. negan negan was a little bit little too far for me like like it's kind of like you know i i don't condone, condone that behavior so why am i watching it on tv why am i buying into this thing why am i supporting this right yep and because i think like right from the get-go when he he first showed up and did what he did you know i didn't i didn't really like that and then this season there was another character or a series of yeah, a character just like negan in a sense that just took it a little too far for me right and mm. um you know um short of killing puppies you know what i was kind of saying like yeah it was just it just went too far and and this and like it's just I, I don't see it ever ending it's just it's like watching depression you know <laughs> well that's i mean they say it's like agony porn right it's just yeah that's it, it's not yeah. you know it, it's kind of lost it's you know, sort of social insight through line and it's it's sure. optimism that this could get better. It's just become, you know, it gets better just so that they, they build them up so they can knock them down. And, and there's yeah. only so much of that you can take before you just either you become numb to it or you just hate it and walk away. And I think right. more than a few people have just walked away. Well, speaking of agony porn, um, ABC also canceled The Kids Are All Right the other day. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you watched The Kids Are All Right. It's a 70s show about a, a Catholic family, husband and wife with, with eight kids. And the kids are just like it, it's it's comedy gold i mean like it, it's from an agony point of view anybody who grew up in the 70s and some of you guys who grew up in the 80s would appreciate you know like putting putting your brother in a cardboard box and pushing him off the roof that kind of comedy right? <laughs> um you know all these the kids are all and it's it's sort of it's sort of a boy meets world kind of thing where the you know the adult is narrating the story about the younger i guess it's similar to young sheldon in, in that sense too right yeah um but it's you know it's got that sort of it's instead of boy meets world it's like family meets world and all the boys have particular characters about them. One of them is like the real con artist kind of guy. Uh, another one is the do-gooder. You know, there's the the son that went into the clergy and then changed his mind and grew his hair. You know, that kind of stuff. And you know, walks around bare feet and stuff like that. But and the the, the mother and father are are I don't want to say classic '70s parents, but sort of like ridiculously funny. Like they're they're they 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 have the kids because they have to have kids, and you know, they're all there's to it, and they get through their days. It's it's pretty funny, and uh, there was a tweet went out yesterday by uh, narrated by one of the characters on the show um, that sort of talked about the fact that ABC canceled them and, and hoping that Netflix picks them up. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's so. always the the, the lament this time of year is people are like, oh, you know, my favorite series has been canceled. Who will pick? Who will pick it up? Oh, is, is it cancel season or something? Yeah, well, this is the time of year the upfronts start happening. So this is yes, this oh. is the sort of couple weeks where series wrap up. A lot of the sort of stereotypical September to may series wrap up and then uh yeah we get sort of the news of their cancellations and you know non-renewals and you know short-term renewals so every all the major networks have done their announcements this week of, of what's been canceled
canceled and what has uh, been renewed and also what their new series will be that they've been picked up from pilots. It's pretty much the only show that I had queued up on my PBS PBR from uh, from ABC recently. It's my Tuesday night show. So, yeah, too bad. Yeah, yeah, I lost uh, the one of the only a few series that were canceled that, that I uh, was watching, but Life in Pieces is a, uh, a funny show that I enjoy and that one got canceled too, a comedy. Really? Hmm. But, uh, you know, again, it's the way things go, right? You know, the, the way that these businesses are run, you know, they need to see whatever it is they need to see and they don't have to go. Well, I mean, George, talk, we talked to George about um, CNN once and, and I, I can't remember if I asked him on a podcast or asked him in person, but he kind of said that, you know, when you when you sell to, I think it was on on Roundabout Creative Chaos, but when you sell a show, you sell 13 shows. You do, you, the contract is, you do these 13 shows I'm, and I'm talking about his, his talk format show that was on CNN for a while. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he kept getting bumped because, you know, people kept doing bad things things on CNN and then they had to break away and, and cover that, right? Yep. So more often than not, I watched Anderson Cooper rather than George when I wanted to watch the show. But um, And he had some interesting, interesting guests, but some of the shows just never never going to see the light of day because they just, you know, they were bought by CNN and they got shelved, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, there, was, I, there wasn't enough of them shown for him to gain any ground and they kind of went went away. But <laughs> that's the way it goes in TV land. Yep. Anyway, so um, yeah, so uh, you've got a story here about the Game of Thrones. It Game seems. of Thrones, yes. So uh, there was a a bit of a buzz this week uh, after the penultimate episode aired that uh, that perhaps George R. R. Martin was waiting for the end of the TV series and then was going to suddenly drop the right. final two books. Um, and so everyone was you know excited at the prospect. Of, oh, this is happening! This is happening! Um, and so it was actually. Um, it was Ian McElhenney who played Barristan Selmy on Game of Thrones from seasons one through five. Um, he was the member of the King's Guard who was fired by Joffrey, and then he went across the sea and worked for Daenerys for a while. Right. He he uh, was appearing at a fan convention, and he said um, the alleged quotes of this here on Entertainment Weekly. I'll say I'll say it's alleged quotes. Uh, George already has written books six and seven. As far as he's concerned, there are only seven books. Um, but he struck an agreement with David and Dan, the showrunners on the series, that he would not publish the final two books until the series was complete. Um, so George R. R. Martin, of course, hopped onto social this week to say, if they were done, I would put them out there. I make millions of dollars and so do my publishers. If there were book books were finished, they would be here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, a bit of a nonsense rumor, but it did uh, get people excited for a little while there because, uh, you know, this seemed like somebody who could be in the know. Uh, but apparently he has been shot full of holes and uh, is back been debunked by George R. R. Martin, who said, yeah, if the books were done, you'd have the books. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah. And speaking of Game of Thrones, uh, we got confirmation this week. So we had talked last week about how uh, we're going to be getting the alternating uh, Avatar and Star Wars movie starting in 2021. Uh, the next Star Wars movie after uh, Last Skywalker, which is coming out this December, is going to be not until 2022. And we weren't sure what we were getting, if that was going to be uh, uh, Gareth Edwards, uh, who did The uh, Last Jedi, um, or if it was going to be the one that was being worked on by uh, Benioff and Weiss, the two co-creators of TV series Game of Thrones and this week it was confirmed it is going to be the, the Benny Hoff and Weiss so they've now wrapped up Game of Thrones they're going to have a little bit of a breather and then they're going to spend the next few years working on uh, the first in, first mm. installment of their Star Wars trilogy which we still don't know what it's going to be about uh, but apparently it is going to be away from the Star Wars uh, Skywalker saga right, right interesting cool and the last little bit I got here today Yay. was some really great news uh, for fans of Rick and Morty Rick and Morty is Ooh. coming back in November uh, we got a little little teaser video that came out today uh, we got the, the link in the show notes. You can have a look at it. It doesn't really say very much, but uh, just the fact that it's coming back uh, almost a two, well, over two years, be more than two years by the time that uh, it finally comes back in November. So the last season aired. Um, obviously, the, the creators uh, have signed a very lucrative deal to keep producing those. So uh, this is the first of many seasons to come. Hopefully it won't take that long between the two. But considering how high the quality level has been over the last three seasons, I guess we'll take it. Right. right cool. So there's a little poll here on the website that you've linked here, and I just took it. So Rick is Rick is in the lead here, or <laughs> Rick Rick Morty, or cannot choose um, whether people whether music is important to you in your life. Most people said I like it, and some, the next one's uh, it's it's important to me. Uh, the average or the the biggest uh, fan base is uh, fifty five to sixty four. There you mm-hmm. go, Rick fans, go Rick. <laughs> um, it's hard not to love Rick. Yeah, what is he? What is he, what's his word? His word he he make up made up. I can't remember. Wubba, wubba, no, uh, strangely or something like that. I can't 
Schwifty, something like that. Anyway, Schwifty, Schwifty, Schwifty. Yeah, it's Schwifty. pretty Schwifty. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. And yeah. uh, fifty-six percent are male, so forty-four percent female. That's not too far behind. Yep. Cool. All right. Looking forward to that. I like mm-hmm. that show. I, I, it's funny. I've only watched season three and reruns on on um, on the television set here. It's not on any of the streaming services, is it? Uh, no, but uh, we we get Adult Swim here in Canada now, so Ooh, you Adult can Swim. You, you can catch it on uh, on the Adult Swim channel here now. So oh, I have to find out where that is. Is that a yeah. social, like a Rogers thing or? Uh, yeah, it no? comes as, I, I don't know if it's on standard package, but I, I, it popped up for me one day. It was just like, hey, you get this channel now. I was like, great. I love this stuff. So yeah, the Robot Chicken cool. and uh, Eric Andre show and that and all cool. kinds of good stuff on there. All right. Okay, cool. All right. So here we are. We're at the um, Game of Thrones part of the show. Season eight, episode five. One more episode to go after this one. This one is called The Bells, which I didn't know until just this very minute, <laughs> but makes perfect sense having watched the show. Yep. Um, a lot of people complained about this show. A lot of people didn't like this particular episode. I don't know if yes. you heard that at all. I, I did. So I've got some some uh, links in there that we'll discuss. Maybe we will do our recap and our thoughts, and then maybe we'll, sure. we'll get into that because there's okay. uh, there's a whole world of discussion to be had around this episode. Yeah, we don't need to do a play by play. But what one interesting comment I have about this, and of course, if you haven't watched it, turn off the TV or turn off the podcast. But uh, this is your last warning. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that we didn't see a lot of people actually die, except for the worm that that uh, was the advisor to uh, Cersei. What's his name? Kyburn. Kyburn. Yeah, except for him. Like you know, because the the two brothers, the Gwen brothers, what are they called again? Oh, the Clegane's. They're the Clegane's. Uh, they yeah. they go through the wall. We never really see them. They in like the Emperor in Star Wars, ball of flame. Right? They land into that. Yeah. Um, we never really see what happens with Cersei and and uh, Jamie because they kind of get you know they're just they're trapped in this piece and it fades away. A lot. There's a lot of scenes in this in this show where things fade away to black and then you you know you pick up another part of the story. So, but anyway, let's let's dig in. Have you made notes? Oh yes, I have some notes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Whoa, him to the ground. To the floor. Yes, exactly. Off uh, you go. Yeah. So I mean, uh, just we'll do the very high level recaps. So the high level recap is that uh, Daenerys is very very angry uh, because uh, in consecutive episodes she lost her two closest confidants in Jorah and Missandei. Uh, then she finds out at the beginning of this episode that Barris has been trying to betray her or has betrayed her, right, right. and that that's because circling down the line that Tyrion betrayed her and that also John betrayed her and that also Sansa betrayed her. Uh, so she's feeling very betrayed. Um, and so she's she's quite angry and then she decides, okay, well, first of all, we're going to have to get rid of Varys. So she gets Drogon to roast Varys. And then she can, she sort of has a little moment with John where she sort of says, you know, I hope that, you know, we can, you know, like, people don't love me here. I hope that we can find a way for this to work. And John she tries to kiss John and John says he loves her, but then you can tell he's still a little grossed out by the like I'm making it with my aunt thing and and uh, so she says you know well if I have to rule by fear I'll rule by fear which is a little right. obviously for uh, foreshadowing of what's going to happen as the episode. a little yeah yeah a little bit um, and so yeah the, basically the story unfolds that there's going to be this big battle we knew it was coming everybody's been able to see this coming for you know years and years and years it's the battle of the queens it's going to be Cersei and her scorpions versus Daenerys and her dragons or dragon at this point um, and so it plays out with you know, Tyrion and John sort of advising, like, you know, hey, you know, you can bring your dragon in there and you can do what you want. We'll bring in the Insulid and the Dothraki. We'll bring in the Northmen. Uh, you know, we've got a plan. But if they ring the bells, that means they're surrendering. And this that is means Tyrion th- talking, right? This is Tyrion talking. Yeah. Says, and, he, basically, and he tries to set that up throughout the whole show, right? Yeah. He says, basically, you know, if they, they ring the bells, that means they're quitting. So stop the attack. And so then he also, he ends up having this, this very lovely scene with uh, Jay Jamie. So Jamie gets caught trying to come back down from Winterfell by uh, Daenerys's soldiers, and then uh, uh, Tyrion basically gets in there and frees him and says, "You go back to King's Landing, sneak in. I'll tell you the way to get into this place. Sneak in, save Cersei and your baby. Get the heck out of Dodge, and there won't need to be a fight. But on your way out the door, tell them to ring the bells because it's gonna. Otherwise, it's not gonna stop. They're just gonna sack the city and destroy it. And so all that setup leads to a very pretty cool fight." scene where basically uh, 
uh, you know, starts with Danny soaring out of the sky. She zooms down. She torches the Iron Fleet. Uh, Euron and all his boats, they're trying to shoot Drogon with the uh, the Scorpions. Has far less luck than he did last week when he put holes full of, you know, uh, Rhaegal yeah. dropped into yeah. the ocean. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of wonder, so j- just on that sort of tactical point of view, right? Like, obviously, da- Daenerys is steering Drogon, you know, mm. to, to fly below or fly above, so they have to adjust their their scorpions, right? I think that, and kind of like when she kind of, when she flies in towards the land, and she flies low, so they they can't aim down, kind of thing. Um, I, I I kind of wonder, like, how did she figure out that kind of tactical warfare in like her? How long has she been riding dragons for? Well, she's been riding dragons for about four years in our show I time, guess, but guess, yeah. but yeah, I think she she has the right strategy of you know she saw that obviously you know Rhaegal and Drogon were sort of sitting ducks there yeah, for a while, but yeah. also don't forget she also has come across the 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 uh, Night King who was throwing darts at them for a couple of seasons there too. Right. So I think she's gotten to the idea of like, this is how I got to, I got to play this game when I'm writing this thing. This is how this right. works. Right. So yeah. So she uses this pretty sound strategy, ends up basically torching the entire iron fleet, torching a, a good number of the scorpions on the one side, and then zooms through the city and blows the hole through the main gate using Drogon, killing most of the golden company, which was the, the, the mercenaries that were hired by Cersei. Uh, at which point the Northmen, the Dothraki and the Unsullied all come flying in and start basically going after the Lannister forces and the remaining Golden Company uh, while Danny takes out the rest of the, the Scorpion. Um, while, while Cersei and Kyburn watch the whole thing happening in front of them and are just like, no, no, we, we can still get in one good shot. We can still get in one good shot. But clearly they're they're up the creek. So um, the fight plays out like you'd expect. Boom. You know, uh, Daenerys is just, you know, roasting soldiers. The, the forces, her forces are far too much. They have no way to stop them. And so then you hear the townspeople basically saying, okay, ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. Um, and they do. And the bells ring and you're like, yeah, okay. The, the mercenaries so the, also drop all their swords when they're faced off against John as well, right? That's right. So the, the Northmen and the Draki and the uh, and the Unsullied are basically storming the city. Mm-hmm. They come across about, I don't know what, like a hundred Lannister soldiers blocking, yeah. a, a blocking a roadway. Yeah. And they're like, you know what? We give up. Like, there's nothing we can do to stop you guys at this point because yeah. the, the yeah. dragon will kill us all. Uh, so yeah, so they ring the bells. And you're like, okay, so now what? And then we get this, you know, scene of Daenerys just sort of chewing on her lips and looking really, really mad. And, and you know, as she sort of has that, that moment of clarity where she sort of decides, you know what? You know, this is not fear. They don't fear me yet, you know? And right. and I can't rule by love in this country, so it's going to have right. to be fear. And she just basically says, okay, Drogon, let's go for a fly. And she spends the next 40 minutes yeah. burning down all of King's Landing and burning down the entire Red Keep. And the Red Keep, yeah, yeah. Um, which is, I mean, it's spectacular. And the way they filmed it, again, Miguel Sapochnik, the, the same uh, director who did The uh, the Long Night and The Art Home and The Battle of the Bastards. And he's just a genius when it comes to doing these fight scenes. Um, the chaos, the, the the perspectives that he's using and stuff like that. The dragon. Uh, somebody pointed out online, I thought it was really astute, and I didn't notice it in the moment, but, but when it was pointed out to me, I thought, gosh, that is really smart. They never showed Daenerys on the dragon when she was torching the city. All you saw was the dragon. Oh, really? Okay. Hmm. And, and the point being there, of course, that, you know, that she is the dragon. She has become the dragon. She is one oh, with the dragon. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So from the, you see everything from a really grounded perspective. You see them from, you know, you see the dragon and the devastation. You see the people's perspective. You see Arya's perspective. You see right. what's happening on the ground. But all you know is that this, this monster has been unleashed on the city. Right. And the metaphor, of course, is that she is the monster that has been unleashed on the city. Right. And there's the um, lore of the dragons, too. Like, there's a history of the dragons. They have the dragon skulls and, and underneath the Red Keep. Yep. You know, and, and the whole mythos around the dragons and how horrible they were. And, you yep. know, and, um, and, and so whatever. as this is happening, you know, John is just horrified because the, the chaos around them, the forces, the Dothraki, the Unsullied, uh, and even the Northmen are sacking the city. They're, you know, they're killing and people they're mercilessly. Torched. They are, well, they, and they are too, but they are, they are being monsters too. They're going in there and doing what, you know, people do in a time of, you know, oppression and war. They're, they're slitting people's Rape, throats and, and stealing their things yeah. and raping yeah. and pillaging and all that stuff. And, um, and it's just a horror scene and John's trying to get people to stop and he can't and he doesn't know what to do. And, um, you know, and we get a couple of these little sort of side stories that are playing out with Arya and the Hound, uh, inside and Jamie inside, you know, Jamie goes toe to toe with Euron, uh, Greyjoy, uh, in a really weird fight scene between the two of them. Um, you know, Euron's like, I'm going to be the guy who kills, you know, Jamie. And it's like, uh, 
uh, he's got one hand. Like how, you know, how proud are you of yourself? <laughs> um, but so Jamie basically kills Euron. Uh, or does he? Well, dun, dun, yeah. dun. he puts the sword through him and twists it twice. I, I'm pretty That's sure true. Euron's dead on that beach. But um, but did you see um, Reservoir Dogs? He could live for several hours. I, I guess. I guess. Um, I'm thinking the swords aren't as clean as they used to be. Oh, uh, I guess, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, Reservoir Dogs. Um, so, yeah. So, and then, you know, that sort of builds up to, you know, uh, the Hound basically stops Arya from going in to kill the Queen and says, like, go get out of here. Go find your life. We'll, we'll get into the problems I have with that one in a little bit. But yeah. um, so the Hound goes in, finally has Plagane Bowl, which we've all been waiting for. The Mountain versus the Hound. Uh, the two of them go toe to toe. It is, you know, maybe not, not everything I was hoping for, but it was pretty good. Um, the two of them basically fight to the death. That is the death of both of them. They both just basically uh, well, I fight. Mean, and the thing about it is the Hound actually has some killing blows. I mean, like he, he puts his sword right through his brother. Yep. You know, who's now, he's now like a chemically induced person. He's no longer himself. Yep. And just pulls the sword out. And then, then he puts the, the, his dagger through through his head and, and he continues to fight. And then that's when he realizes the only way to, to do him is to push him out of the wall, uh, push him over the wall, right? But yep. like, yeah, I mean, the hound won that battle three times, right? Yep. You well, know? and the mountain tried. He tried to do his, uh, his, oh, his uh, eyeball thingy. Yeah. Red yeah. Viper his one move, eyeball his one trick. Move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he puts his thumbs into uh, Sandor's eyes and tries to, you know, basically crush his skull like he did with the the Red Viper in the, the famous fight. Yeah. Uh, but of course, he stops him by putting this, putting a dagger through his face. Um, but yeah, again, you know, maybe not everything I was hoping for, but still pretty satisfying and kind of the way that it had to end. That you know, that one you could say it ended in a draw, but basically, you know, it was it was uh, you know the Hound basically making the decision. It was Voldemort like, and Harry Potter. Give your give your head a shake. Well, yeah, it was basically you know if if I have to die to kill you i'm willing to do that and exactly yeah you know so so it goes down like that so so we lose the hound again not a surprise i think um of course we, we mentioned in there that the mountain decided uh in one of the funnier scenes uh kyburn decides to get in between the mountain and the hound by saying you know no you must obey your queen and the mountain just <laughs> throws him to the ground so hard he smashes his skull in um yeah. that was pretty funny um yeah, the queen slinks away and again another very kind of funny scene she sort of tiptoes between the two of them and takes off yeah um, yeah, yeah. She's reunited with Jamie. The two of them, uh, you know, Jamie decides, okay, I'm going to follow uh, Tyrion's plan. I'll take you down here. We'll get out of here. They get down to, you know, the lower part of the castle, and uh, there's no way out. They're trapped in there. And the walls are falling the, in. Yeah. The walls are falling in. The ceiling's caving in. And we are to assume at that point, two of them are crushed uh, by the falling castle and, and die in each other's arms. Again, we'll, we'll get into some of that. But yeah, I have a problem with that one, too. Yeah, not yeah. that part, but yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, while, of course, all this stuff is going on. Arya is our avatar inside, not unlike she was for for uh, the Long Night too, where you get that scene of her inside the castle dodging uh, monsters. And this time, it's you know basically dodging debris and trying to save people's lives and trying to and not get toasted, yeah. not get roasted from above by Daenerys, who is now at this point indiscriminately killing anybody who basically comes across, just burning the entire city to the ground. Um, you know, very again, very effective, very very well done, really really well acted by Maisie Williams. Um, I was. I was quite impressed with her. Um, and, you know, the, the, the episode ends basically with, you know, uh, ash falling on the city like snow. So winds it looked a lot winter. like 9-11, I have to say. Well, it did, but it was kind of, it kind of had a, you know, a little winter kind of feel to it, right? You know, we're sort of, yeah, winter yeah. has come, winter is coming. Or the burning of the tree in Avatar as well. Yeah, well, the, yeah, it's basically it's the aftermath. There are people burned. So there's there's, there's this uh, a mother and daughter couple that, that Arya has run into several times as she's trying to get in and out of the city. And, and uh, she tried to save their lives at one point in the very end where she sees them both burned to death in each other's arms on the street um you know and then she like climbs Pompeii, aboard. yeah yeah she climbs aboard this uh bloodied white white horse and rides off towards the uh edge of the city was so that uh, a metaphor uh, yeah i think um yeah if you know your bible and you know your literature it's yes riding a pale horse yes um what's the metaphor <clears throat> well upon a pale horse right no i don't get it so what expound please so the idea is that she is basically uh, she's death at that point. She is going to be the the, oh, really? the avatar of death. Oh, really? Okay, hmm. interesting. Yeah, because because I kind of went like we were talking about this at work, and and the scene just before that, when when the mother and daughter get toasted, roasted, whatever you want to call it, um, she's just around the corner. Like she literally dies behind a wall, and and is protected by that that flame, and then then she gets up in the sort of really mystical, um, you know. 
sense and sees the horse and moves towards it and you know calms it and gets on it and rides off into the into the you know out of the city which yep. seems to be calm at this point yep. but so i kind of wonder like is that is that like is that like the the unicorn scene in blade runner you know is it, is it like a metaphor of so you, i was trying to look up the actual biblical reference so it's yeah. it's Re- book of revelation 6 8 uh death rode upon the city with a uh, on a pale horse so oh okay so again so it is a metaphor it's a metaphor um right. literally and yeah and it's a metaphor for death so okay. the question is has she become death or is is it a representation you know she is among the death does this mean that she is now going to be the one who goes after daenerys uh for what she's done um uh, so it leaves, leaves some interesting speculation for this one. Mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so yeah so that's sort of you know probably a too long recap but that was the, that was sort of what happened and it was you know um momentous again we lost some major players in the show varus is dead the hound is dead the mountain's dead Kyburn's yeah. dead Cersei's jamie's dead, dead. Cersei's dead. Euron's so, dead. Um, yeah, it's 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 another sort of you know last season bloodbath. So let's circle back to and, and again, it's 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 typical of of Game of Thrones that, that it's just suddenly they're dead, right? It's over. It worked, right? Yep. Now, did you find that Cersei didn't try hard enough? Like that's not the Cersei I know. Um, like she set up her defenses, right? She had the scorpions all around the city. She she had she felt she had the upper hand. There were explosions of, of what was it called wildfire. Wildfire, yeah, wildfire. throughout the city city right yeah. yeah but you know she's like she toasted the the what was the guy the the, the jonathan uh guy played um the, the oh uh, the, yeah creature. the uh the um sparrow Sp- high sparrow yeah the high, high sparrow. sparrow she toasts the whole you know high sparrow people yep she blows up the entire high uh, the sept of balor the great sept of balor right from a distance right like from like across the city like remote control she had like a little you know her apple apple tv remote she pushed the button and blew them up right yeah um and then, of course that was after the the death of her son but um no that caused the death of his son oh caused the death of her son okay right yeah because yeah, that was his, his girlfriend or wife his, or yeah his died. wife dies in there and so yeah. that's he decides to throw himself out a window but um do you think she, i mean th- like she didn't try hard enough yeah i i'm i honestly don't know like they, they did set it up as you know all the you know it's a weakened you know daenerys lost a bunch of her forces when she went north and she's lost two of her dragons and this is gonna get really bad and they tried to sort of give you this illusion that you know uh with these scorpions that, that took out Rhaegal last week, like she yeah. was really weakened and that this was going to be a, a walkover, which is good because it really was kind of a good sort of, you know, ruse. You When when the fight was about to start, you were like, hmm, maybe this is going to get really nasty. Um, but within about, you know, six or seven minutes and you see how effective Drogon is, um, you realize like, yeah, that's, this is, it's, it's, it's like bringing a nuke to a knife fight. Like it's just, it's a joke, right? So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know, like she's sort of there and she's got that smirk and she's feeling confident and she's like oh it's going to be fine it's going to be fine and it's like mm, it's not going to be fine you know like this this is there's really nothing i think she could have done that that would have really been a difference maker i honestly i'm surprised she didn't uh piss off sooner and like just say like i'll i'll rise again another day or something again mm. she's she's being really snotty at a couple points she's like well i've got the golden company and i've got the scorpions and i've got and the lannister yeah. forces will fight harder than any cell swords and yeah. you know she's just delusional like you know and, and kyburn's sort of standing there going like we should the writing leave, on the wall lady leave. this yeah, is yeah. this is over we're, we're done um so yeah i think i think it's just i think it's supposed to illustrate to us as the as the viewers you know we had been we had seen two dragons go down yeah it, somewhat easily yeah. um so we had sort of been a allu- you know uh, it had kind of changed our perception of, of just how mighty these animals are um so when he when she goes in there and is using this thing as effectively as she can against you know she's not going against a supernatural being she's not going against you know they're not they don't have the drop on her she can see them coming uh, it's just it's, there's no there's she's no stopping them out yeah. yeah so i think cersei is just you know i think she's just the gas i think she the whole thing is she's supposed to be like first she's de- in denial and then she's just like well w- like here we all are you know like i think she's i think she honestly i think she's probably relieved that it all ends with you know the building burning down around her as opposed to having to surrender and put her head on a block too right right yeah that's true that's true so what do you think about daenerys like do you think there was a point where daenerys should have just stopped like 20 five minutes into this battle or whatever uh i mean so my my thought on the whole thing is and i've heard and you know we talked about it we alluded to the, before our description of the, of the episode a lot of people are very mad because daenerys was for a very long time not just one of the central characters but one of the heroes you exactly, know she yeah, yeah. saved the slaves she tried to fight for right yeah she's done some horrible things along the way but who hasn't um you know these are warriors and, and in, in a very violent time you know there's a lot of very questionable behavior going on in these things um but, but the whole she, period with the 
eggs and the, and the being thrown into the fire and being put up and b- being sent to the widow home. Yeah. When she was queen widow. I mean, like that, all that kind of was, that was sort of her Luke Skywalker, you know, kind of proving her metal, you know, iron, like Arthur pulling the sword, her walking out of the fire with the dragon's eggs, or I guess birth dragons, right? Yep. That was her pulling the sword out of the stone kind of moment, right? Yep. You know, so from that point of view, I mean, I mean, if you, if you look at the history of Alexander the Great for, as an example, he started out really well, but he kind of didn't end well, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think that's the metaphor, right? I think the idea is that, you know, she has all this going for her. She has this momentum. She believes that by divine right, she belongs back on the throne, that the dragons were, again, if you had all these things happen to you, if you went into the fire and you came out with, you know, if you went in with stones and you came out with dragons and people started calling you all those things, you know, she reels off the, you know, uh, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea and the Breaker of Chains and the Mother of Dragons. And you start believing your own hype, right? So she believes that this is her destiny and she should be on the Iron Throne and everything else because she was waffling for a while there. She was talking about, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to break the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. I'm going to end the oppression and everything like that. But then she started more and more over the last year or two talking about, well, the throne is mine. I get thrown. I'm going to be the one on the throne. She's been talking about that with John. Well, you have a claim to the throne. Well, it's funny. She's talking an awful lot about the throne now. When before she was like, well, I'm going to melt the throne. I'm done with the throne. Like, right. we need to fix the system. So now all of a sudden she's really interested in it again. Right, right. So here's another another tangent to go down. And I don't know if you've even thought about this, but one of my friends who watches the show says to me, he's, he started rewatching the show, right? Yeah. And he noticed that in a, around the third season, when John's up on the wall, and just before he gets the sword that given to him by, I forgot the name of the leader, who he saves from the White Walker, I think, right? Um, like, remember the, the scene where in the room and the guy's going to kill him and yeah, John Lord, comes it's in. Lord, Lord Mormont, yeah. Anyway, just before that happened, John burns his hand, yeah. right? So yeah. if he's a Targaryen... But he's not a true-blood Targaryen, he's a half-blood Targaryen. Oh, he's half-blood. So, he, he, so he's susceptible to sunburns and, and blisters and things, right? Yep. And uh, they, they do <laughs> say in, in the books, they do specifically say that not all Tar- Targaryens oh, are... they're not all fireproof. Okay. S- so. Because uh, Viserys, her, Daenerys' older brother Viserys, who's in the first season, um, in the books, they make a reference to the fact that she, uh, when she takes a bath, the water has to be boiling hot, like bubbling right. hot. Right. But he right. doesn't like that. So right. they do establish that it's, it is a trait of, uh, of Targaryens, but it isn't necessarily all Targaryen. Okay. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There was one other thing. I can't remember what it is now. Anyway. So, so what, what have the, these posts that you've got here say? Okay. So, uh, so there's been a lot of backlash. So we know we've sort of shared our opinions. Our opinions are like, in my opinion, uh, this is all, it's all been building to this. I'm not surprised that this is the direction they went with Daenerys. They've been building to it. However, um, I do agree with the sentiment that a lot of people hold out there that this wasn't earned, that it was just too quick for her to go from I'm the hero to I'm the villain. Yeah, um, and I, and totally. I completely agree. I think if this was a 10 season series and we yeah. had time to see her descent into anger and frustration and madness and whatever it is, yeah. I think that that would feel more validated. The problem is, is that you're trying to basically get all this done over the last two seasons well, this is, this and is in the like last the, six episodes and it just feels unearned. It's just like the, the Revenge of the Sith where, where you know, I feel like George Lucas is standing there with a checklist going, okay, this is done. Okay, move on to the next thing. Okay, this is done. Yeah, it, it is. And, the, and, we, and we've been joking about it for two seasons that they went from, you know, uh, you know, Low in the pace. first season, it takes them, you know, a year in the series to walk yeah. from place to place. Yeah. And now, like, they hop in the teleporter and they're there overnight. Yeah. You know, that's the deal okay so that's that's the byproduct of the accelerated seasons you got to get it done the actors want to move on the series runners want to go right you know make star wars movies it's the reality okay fine so you suspend a little disbelief and just say okay they did take that long it's just that yeah. we don't have to watch it all this time yeah but that works if you're like hey we don't need to see people on the king's road for you know six episodes going like yep we're still on our way here we're still on our way here but it really hurts when it's something like daenerys going from being a hero to being a monster you right. need to take the time to process that you need to show the descent from you know I am feeling isolated. I've lost my yeah. friends. I've lost my uh, my assets. I went from being the most beloved person in Essos to the most reviled person in in Westeros. Um, it, it just is too fast. It's just too fast. You can't you can't do that. It feels like a sudden slam change of gears, and people are gonna are gonna have a backlash. And so that being said, the internet went ballistic this week. Uh, mm. People are losing their marbles. So the, a couple of the links I have in here, and we'll we'll keep them in here. Um, there's a 
petition on change.org for <laughs> HBO to have to remake season eight. Oh, so really? these, I'm sure the same geniuses who wanted them to remake The Last Jedi. I don't like what you're saying, so therefore you should change your art. Okay. Uh, but right now it has 156,000 signatures. Right. So well. clearly there are some people who agree. Uh, the other thing is that uh, people are Google bombing uh, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff uh, because they now are doing it so that if you search for bad writers, it returns images of the two of them. Google bombing. Okay. Yeah. Um, because they think that, uh, you know, that's the way to illustrate that they are frustrated with the, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, other posts have tried to pin images of the two of them to the search terms dickheads and dumb and dumber. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So again, people are clearly quite mad. Uh, I saw a great article this, this week that I, I, I will try and find for us um, about people who are mad because they named their children Daenerys um, because they were such big fans of the series and she was the hero. <laughs> of course, now she's started to, to be like a war criminal <laughs> and they're like, right, right. my daughter's named after this woman who just like murdered children and um, we're not happy about this. Right, right. Very yeah. funny. Uh, and yeah, so people are just are just going crazy. Um, it did have the highest rating of any um, Game of Thrones episode ever. Most people ever watched it. Um, but the backlash has been fast and furious. Again, I don't think her turn is out of character. A lot of people do, and that's their frustration. I think this was always part of the part of the deal. You know, from the way that she, you know, she literally uh, was, you know, burning people alive. Yeah. She's she been, did say she was going to come and kick their ass, like, she, all the time. On even the back island. with the, the masters, you know, the masters, when they crucified uh, the the, the slaves when she was trying to you know rescue the slaves in Essos yeah, yeah. and then she in turn had them all crucified um, you know she's 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 got the dragon in her you know this is not out of character um, you know and again I think she basically in that moment I just don't know that they had enough time to illustrate or give enough perspective for people to accept the fact that you know she says to John you know if I can't rule by love I'll rule by fear right right she burns only basically the military targets and the they're like, we quit. And she's like, they're not going to fear me. They're going to, you know, yeah, I'm going to end up with the, all the these people, exactly, yeah. you know, that is just going to be the next ruler who's got a pet dragon, you know? Well, she's like, well, what? So tomorrow, if somebody decides to assassinate my dragon, then what? Right? Right. But right. she basically makes that call. You know what? I, I got to do this. So she just loses her marbles and just decides, you know what? It, I'll show them fear. And she right, does. Right, right. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely out on what she did, um, but I can see why people are, are ticked who people who are invested and cared and wanted to see her, uh, you know, come out on top, be the queen, be the, the the just ruler, whatever, or for her and John to rule together. Again, I think, you know, when we look forward to next week, um, it's hard to see a way in which the Arias, Sansas, Johns of the world don't, you know, take great exception to her actions. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that's going to be an issues there. And does she, uh, from there, does, you know, does she execute Tyrion for betraying her? Uh, true, he, true. You know, yeah. there's, there's still some stuff on the table. And again, she's, she came out of this fight with her dragon still intact. A lot of her Unsullied and Dothraki still alive. There are still a lot of people mm-hmm. that are loyal to her. You know, Grey Worm's still there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they how they wrap this up. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, it sort of all goes back to, to when Cersei and, and her are talking and Cersei keeps saying, what about the North? And then Daenerys or pulls Sansa her hand back. Sansa. Sa- sorry, Sansa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sansa and, and Daenerys are talking. But, yeah. the you know, that that obviously, that that's one particular decision decision she's not prepared to make and but and all the way through her her whole arc she's you know something bad happens you do something bad to her she's like okay screw you yep you know no matter what it is and and um she you know she always has some way of, of getting a little bit of vengeance you know this is probably the, the most extreme example that she's had right you know be right her justice is to torch people she torched uh sam's uh, yep. father sam? and brother yeah yeah father and brother and and yep. yeah for not wanting to cooperate and so on and so forth just to show that the kind of power she will Right. Yep. And the Plus one thing. Sorry. Yeah, right. No, I was going to say she's also got the love of her people. I mean, you know. The, well, the, she does, although less and less so. Like again, the the Dothraki follow her because she rose from the flames, and yeah. you know they were like, oh, she's you, mystical, must, you yeah. must be it. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Again, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. I must say, the more that I reflected on this, the more I thought, I wonder how this last episode is going to play out. This whole series, when you think about it, and 
and George R. R. Martin has said before, was about subverting tropes and expectations, right? Right. Yeah. So, you know, you've got, you know, the beautiful princess and the handsome knight uh, who are, you know, in typical stories are the heroes. In this one, they're the monsters. Um, you know, dragons are nightmares in, in these ones, but here they're heroic figures. You know, there's there's all these things that are jumbled up uh, based on, you know, the tropes of, of fantasy and science fiction storytelling and, and just storytelling in general. And it was the first time at the end of this episode, I found myself thinking all the discussion has been who's going to who's going to sit on the throne at the end or who's how's it going to play out and who ends up with who and stuff like that my question at the end of this was who says this has to have a happy ending right right that's true like i think that there's an expectation you know you're going to finish a series a lot of people are invested but who says it has to have a happy ending mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like who says you have to walk away going oh good that person paired off with that person and they're all in love and this person survived and they it's all happy good and go lucky that that's that's not necessarily the case maybe mm-hmm. this is destined to end badly true true. you know maybe both john and danny die in the next episode you mm. know like maybe this is always going to be a mess and that's <laughs> part of the point yeah yeah interesting so one last thing before we wrap we close we, we get going to our watch list but yep. um when she hands uh gray worm Daenerys hands gray worm the only thing that what's her name Thrani left behind sunday yeah Miss sunday left behind is, is her collar right yes yeah her slave collar her, yeah her only possession and he just tosses it in the fire what do you think about that yeah i mean i think that's a good illustration of uh of how far gone he is i think we're supposed to at that point just understand that you know he is just not about sentimentality at this point what he's about is vengeance. oh you think oh okay okay i kind of wondered if it was because you know he's sort of like never looked back kind of you know this no is- I, I i took that to mean you know I, I don't care right now i don't care about you know sitting here and crying i don't care about mourning her loss i care about making who did this to her pay right burn them burn them, burn them. yeah and, yeah, and that's exactly right. Word, that's, right that's you're absolutely right it's an it's a very very clear metaphor for the final message from a sunday with you know, burn them all burn them all yeah. and yeah. to be fair she did yeah that's true she she kept she, she that's true she was asked to burn burn to burn them down basically yep yep in in one word but yeah still it probably has it's probably one of those like you know just rocky words that has multiple meanings or multiple levels you know? <laughs> yeah right. um i think it's high valyrian actually but um yeah, yeah. so so what's your take what uh, how do you think this ends how do i think it ends yeah at this point in time i really don't know it's kind of like the ending of mash i remember leading up to that wondering how that last episode was going to turn out or or even you know the last episode of the next generation like where where is this going to go um i don't know does it start five years in the future maybe i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and they find these gems and they have to go back into the past and fix everything um hopefully not yeah i kind of so um based on what you were saying i wonder i want i'd wonder about john and and daenerys I, th- I think daenerys i mean daenerys could end up on the throne that would be pretty cool but i have a feeling like you said that there's going to be some major conflict between her and daenerys it's funny that that Arya hasn't done the man with no face trick yeah re- recently right yeah. Um, because she's, I, I would think she's still got that up her sleeve, right? Um, because that was always a cool. I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever saw those coming when she she pulled those murders off, but no, um, it was excellent. Yeah, yeah, they were they were real surprises, but um, yeah, I I kind of I kind of think it could be Sansa, it could be it could be Arya, yeah, you know, that ends up ends up uh, standing. Yeah, I wonder. I, I even wonder if there will be a throne at the end. I wonder if if you know what's left. You know? Well, where is it? It's buried in the rubble right now. <laughs> well, I wonder if we're gonna get a scene. So in there's a scene in one of the first few seasons where uh, Daenerys, is the, remember her dragons get stolen, mm-hmm. um, and then she ends up in the House of the Undying, and she has a vision of uh, seeing the throne room in King's Landing with uh, white stuff falling from the sky and the roof blown off. Oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. So we actually got a glimpse of that, but I think the idea is that um, uh, we, at the time we thought it was that winter had come to to King's Landing. In this case, oh, it could just be right. ash, right? right? It could be it could be this. What she, we've seen is that she's destroyed, you know, not destroyed that part of the keep uh, so yeah huh. what do you think uh i i i wondered if there was some foreshadowing in um what tormund said to john where he, he said you know you belong with us in the north you belong in the north i wonder if he's going to have to kill danny and then he can't live he doesn't want to be the king he doesn't want to live with it and he goes back and he becomes you know uh a northman he goes yeah. uh, not like a northman like where his family is but like yeah, goes to the, the, the far north, north. Yeah. the true north yes um i wonder if that's his destiny and then uh my thought after that was maybe Tyrion and Sansa end up together. Uh, you know, a Lannister and a and a Stark. Mm, I keep forgetting about Tyrion. Yeah, he seems to he seems to be uh, bulletproof. Well, uh, that is assuming that he doesn't get you know scorched by his uh, you know his his queen for freeing Jamie 
and and suggesting that she stand down. Do um, we see where he ends up in the war, like in this battle? Is he? Does he? No, he he's just. He, we see him walking around and being like horrified at what he's seeing, but we don't really get a resolution beyond his horror because he he knows that she basically didn't listen to him and that she um you know did, did this even though she did, she didn't need to. Right. Right. All right. Well, let's move on to the watch list. Yes, indeed. Shall we? Yes. All right. So I got a couple of things on the watch list. Uh, the first one is Prospect. I don't know if you remember my talking about Prospect as something I was looking forward to seeing. Mm. Um, it's a sci-fi. It's a. It's a basically about a. a it starts off with a daughter and her fa- father who are prospectors. They're they're on a foreign planet. You know, um, almost like they've almost got like a little you know airstream. You know, cheap little Walmart bought. You know, pod space pod that they they land on these planets. Um, they obviously have to go collect some some um, uh, gems that are worth money, and then they they get picked up by uh, another freighter, and, and away they go. Right, that's sort of their their life. Right, they're they're scavengers, prospectors, that kind of stuff. Right, mm-hmm. um, and from a from a sci fi perspective, these these are the kind of stories I used to love as a kid. Like uh, I, I remember doing some of the advanced, we had these reading modules we had to do in grade school, and that's when I first got introduced to the idea of protagonist antagonist and that kind of stuff through you know English comp- comprehension, right? Um, which I wasn't really good at because I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> but um, but they had these amazing sci-fi stories about, you know, which were sort of written from the point of view of not so much, you know, you know, you pull out a gun and you shoot somebody or, or you know, kind of how, how traditional sci-fi goes, but sort of more pulpy sci-fi. Like, you know, okay, it's like here it is, you know, the, we're in the future some point in the future. They figured out space travel. It's almost like, you know, the, the, the ship that uh, the Nostronomo, Nostronomo from Aliens, you know, they're, they're on a mission to mine, you know, kind of thing. And mm-hmm. it's sort of the freighter mentality. I think I talked about, I think the first book or the second book of the foundation is very much like that sort of, you know, space faring kind of stuff, you know, like, like, like Firefly was. So from that point of view, it's really interesting. So they land on this planet, um, the ship breaks down, um, and they run into another prospector who's played by the guy who had his eyes squished out in Game of Thrones. Um, the Hound? No, the other guy. Oh, oh, Oberon. The, Oberon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same the actor. Viper. Yeah, yeah. And he shows up, you know, with he shows up and and you know, you know basically finds them and, and starts to starts to play mind games with them and stuff like that, which is the kind of kind of sci fi I like. It's sort of the sort of do you trust this person? Don't you trust this person? All the people on this planet are, you know, they're all out to make a buck kind of thing. And there's not that many of them. And the planet is hostile. So everybody has to wear their helmet all the time and there's this uh, this constant um, dust flying. They call it the dust flying around the around the air, and it's really toxic to to humans. So they have to stay covered up, either in their spa- their little space pods, or they have to stay covered up. So it's a really short. It's a short movie, probably like uh, maybe ninety minutes, two hours at, at most. Um, and it's it's basically from the point of view of, this, of the, the daughter uh, living through this kind of existence, you know, kind of thing, right? Um, you know, she's got her little music player, and she's but her dad's got her doing chores like cleaning air filters and stuff like that. And it's it's a really neat sort of story about from the point of view of, I mean, first it's a neat story, but it's also an interesting story from the point of view of how would you survive in that kind of uh, situation? You know, it's not not like going camping with your dad, but it kind of is, you know? <laughs> That's the first one. The second one, of course, is The Wandering Earth, which I talked about earlier. Um, really good movie. I mean, like, it's, it'd be really cool to see this in, like, a big theater. Like, a, it's it certainly does work well on, on, a, on a big TV at home. Um, it's, the production level is like Hollywood plus, you know, in terms of like special effects and practical effects and, and all the renderings and, and artboards and everything like there's, it's seamless in terms of how that works. The story is, is interesting. Um, it's about basically the, the sun is, 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 has expanded and now the people on earth have to find somewhere else to go. And so they kind of, I'm not going to give it away, but they, they kind of fi- have to figure out how to go from one place to the other. And, you know, there's, it starts off with an astronaut who goes up to his, like a space station, like a like uh, like our space station here, lives there for fifteen years uh, while he's on this special special mission, and his son and, and his adopted daughter are raised by their grandfather on Earth in this futuristic Earth kind of thing, right? And but they know that this it kind of a bit like the what's the one with the, the asteroids landing on the um, landing on the Earth and going to destroy it? Oh, Armageddon? Uh, not Armageddon, the, the good one. Um, oh, Deep Impact. Deep Impact, yeah, and you know, like Sam Jack or not Sam Jackson, but um, the other guy is uh, the other 
Oh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman is the president. Yeah, that that one. Yep. And and you know uh, Frodo is you know got the girlfriend and they get, <laughs> he wins the golden ticket and that kind of stuff, right? Um, Elijah Wood. But uh, it's it sort of got that sort of there's sort of the tension between the father and the son and the the adopted daughter and the grandfather. The grandfather is hilarious kind of thing, right? And it's about how they they and of course you know there's a big catastrophe that happens as they're as they're going through this whole episode. Plus, pl- but like I said, the special effects are like like top notch, top notch stuff. Cool. So, yeah. So I definitely definitely recommend people you know, stop what you're doing, go watch that right now. Nice. And uh, over to you, John. All right. Well, uh, as far as watch, I would definitely uh, looking forward to catching up on the last uh, season finales of a bunch of my favorite shows. So uh, Supergirl, Flash, and Arrow, all season finales. Uh, Arrow has just aired. It's on my PVR waiting for me. And uh, Flash will be popping onto Netflix tomorrow here in Canada. So I'm looking forward to see how those two wrap up. Uh, can't say I was a huge fan of either of their seasons this year. Flash, I mean, Flash is still one of my very favorite series, and I do love the chemistry of the cast, but it was not probably their best season. Um, and Arrow, obviously, um, they're they're working towards uh, wrapping up their season. They're going to do a shortened season starting this fall. So I'm looking forward to see how they uh, sort of set the table for that. Uh, and Supergirl, of course, wrapping up uh, on Sunday. And uh, so I think we're going to get the, uh, the Red Daughter versus Supergirl blowout fight, which should be a lot of fun. And um, that season turned around a little bit for me. I've been a little happier the last few, you know, um, maybe six episodes or so. Um, I, again, I didn't think it was a very strong start to the season, but uh, but they're finishing strong. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how that, that wraps up. Um, more the important other, than that, how are the Raptors doing? The Raptors are, uh, they're up by eight in the third quarter with four minutes to go, but uh, yeah, anything can nothing. happen. That means nothing in basketball. It truly does not. So right. stay tuned, Raptors fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing I tacked on here, which is just one of my favorite things I've seen in ages. So oh, wait, uh, wait, before before you get into this, what do you think about this whole radio station in Milwaukee not playing the Drake <laughs> Drake music? Was well, the best comment I saw was from Matt Galloway on Twitter today. Yeah, who said, yeah. "Who said does this mean we have to stop playing the Violent Femmes?" That made me laugh. Yeah, um, well, and I, I rep- replied to him, "Does that mean we have to stop watching Lover and Shirley reruns?" Yeah, can we can we also stop driving Harley Davidson motorcycles and drinking Miller beer? Also, oh, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it, I, I mean, it's all in good fun. What it does is what Drake it is. have to do with that? Well, I mean, he's a Raptors fan, but. Well, so he's, what? he's the official Raptors celebrity ambassador or whatever. Oh, and he's also, he? oh, he's okay. renowned for being a, a trash talker on the sidelines oh, I see. Uh, right, of, okay. of opposing okay. teams. He was mocking, um, Joel Embiid from the, the 76ers in the last right, series. Right. He's, okay. he's renowned for being, uh, a, a, a troublemaker, troublemaker on the sidelines. Yes. Yes. So. Fair enough. If Gordon Gano from the uh, uh, Violent Femme starts doing that, then we can stop playing their music. Sure. Uh, so yes, this thing, this thing that is my my favorite thing I've seen this week. Uh, there have been teases on uh, Lego's social channels, which of course I follow because I'm that guy. Um, this week that uh, they have been teasing a little bit of Stranger Thing, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. And they announced this week uh, they're doing this amazing, amazing Lego Stranger Things set. That is, it is the upside down from Stranger Things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's a double-sided set that literally flips over from one side to the other. So it's basically a diorama on the top and the bottom, and you basically flip it on its head, and so you're in the upside down. And so it's this sort of famous, you know, it's got all the characters, and it's got the scenes and stuff like that, and it's got the upside down, it's got the Demi Gorgon and stuff like that. It is one of the coolest sets I've seen in ages. Um, very, very, very inventive the way that they've done this, where you've got basically two play sets that are joined uh, with one upside down and the other built around these trees and then you flip it upside down and it sits on the tops of the trees no matter which way you want to have it situated. It's it's extremely cool. Right, right. So I don't remember, like, so I never really got, I know the kids called it the upside down, but is it really meant to be upside down? No, I think the idea is that it's basically another dimension that exists parallel. Which but the kids call the upside down. The kids yeah, call yeah. it the upside down, so they've taken it to that sort of, you know, more literal version of it's literally upside down version of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just it's just such a great idea for a set, and just a lot of fun to have this uh, this all put together. So you can have this little diorama that, if you want, you can have the one side up or the other side up, and all the characters and everything else. Um, it's nice to see them branching outside of sort of the traditional large media uh, Lego sets that we've seen a lot. You know, they, obviously they've done the 
the Marvel and the DC and they've done the Star Wars and, you know, they have branched into a few different areas here. This is sort of a, um, a different way for them to go. But, you know, also right in that pop culture sweet spot they've been in for the last 20 years or so. It's uh, it's perfect. It's a good, great fit. The only drawback of this set is the fact that it's going to cost uh, about $200 US. Dollars. So yeah. probably like 250 ish $260 Canadian. Uh, right, it's, right. it's 2,300 pieces, but still, it's, that's that's not a cheap thing. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yep. All right. Well, I guess that's it for another week. So until next time, or yeah, next time, until next week when we talk about the uh, the finale of Game of Thrones. Jonathan, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK New. All right. And as I kind of screwed up at the beginning, my name is Tim Mitra, T-I-M-M-Y-T-R-A on the Twitter machine this is the best way to get a hold of me. So until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the SpockCast website at SpockCast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at SpockCast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpockCast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at Patreon.com slash SpockCast. You can find details on how to help us out on our website at spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. Cool. There you go. Yeah. Podcast number two in the books. Yeah, you're going for the marathon tonight. Yeah, well, it's my life, right? <laughs> well, you know, you can't be a media mogul without a little hard work. Today, we discuss Miro. Today, I want to talk about the hellscape that is technical diagramming, right? Everybody's nodding their heads right now. Uh huh. And there is a potential solution that I want to share. There was one name that several people brought up. I did some digging, and it's kind of nuts how much this program Miro has for developers. I have to share this. It could potentially be a game changer for you. So my favorite part about Miro is that half the work is already done. Like right now, typically we spend hours starting diagrams from scratch, gathering information. You get buy-in from every team. Uh, You know, that's a lot of work to do. But Miro has a full set of integrations with the tools you're probably already using. And they also offer open APIs and SDKs for custom solutions for all those niche diagramming use cases we have to do, right? So the end result is the same, but it doesn't take forever. It's a massive, massive time saver. I'm transforming basic flowcharts and network architectures, and it all lives in one place. So are you using Miro? Have you used it? I want to hear. That's M-I-R-O dot com. Ya llegó nuestro mejor Black Friday y tenemos miles de ofertas toda la semana, como hasta 75% de descuento en joyería fina después del 40% de descuento extra y da un paso adelante con botas para ella a solo $19.99. Además, encuentra toallas Home Expressions a solo $2.99 cada una. JCPenney, celebraciones que valen la pena. Ofertas válidas hasta el 26 de noviembre en la tienda en selección de estilos. Aplican exclusiones. Ofertas de Black Friday se excluyen de los cupones. Detalles en la tienda con un asociado.